Casey, I'm going to hand it off to you. Why don't you take it? All right. Thanks, Marshall. And thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, thanks to PSFA and Little Star for asking me to, to talk tonight. Um, <clears throat> you can, next slide. Um, my name's Casey Smith. Uh, and with my fiance, Johnny, and my parents, Skip and Betsy, I operate and manage BCS Livestock. Um, on our farm, we grow forage crops that we harvest with sheep and cows. Um, the products that we produce and sell are grass-fed lamb and beef meat, wool blankets, wool hats, yarn, sheep skins, dog treats, and compost. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about my family's five-generation history of farming and ranching and how we grow clean, healthy food and fight climate change on our farm today using regenerative agriculture. You can go back one slide. Uh, my mom, Betsy, who's in the picture there, grew up in Mazama, moving cows in the mountains and packing horses and mules on her family beef cow calf ranch. Um, it was run similar to how many ranches are run today in the Medhow. The mother cows are kept through the winter and fed hay and calve in the late winter or early spring. Um, the cows and calves graze on grass, pasture, or range land throughout the spring, summer, and fall. And the calves are sold when they're nine to 10 months old. Um, from there, after they leave the Medhow, they'll either graze on pasture or go to a feedlot and are eventually fattened and butchered for meat. Next slide. Uh, my dad, Skip, grew up on his family's sheep ranch in Idaho. Um, and there he is as a kid in the picture. Um, his family's ranch was a large scale commercial sheep operation where they ran around 15,000 head of sheep. Next, the sheep would graze on public and private land and were moved across the landscape grazing and were watched over by a sheep herder. The sheep herder would leave, live in a camp wagon like the one in the background of that picture there, or they would use horses and mules to move their camp every few days as they moved with the sheep. Um, in that system, the sheep would graze an area for one or two days and then move on to a new area and let the land rest and regrow for one to two years. Um, they would graze uh, where seasonally appropriate, so in the lowlands in the winter and the mountains in the summer. And there's just another picture of their ranch in Idaho with camp wagons in the background and some workers and dogs in the front. Uh, Today, uh, uh, most like oh, you go back some of the slides. Today, most livestock is sold through um, predetermined contracts or through a video auction before leaving the ranch. Uh, but my grandpa and great grandpa, that's not how it worked in their time. They would load their lambs onto train cars and ride with the lambs to Chicago to the livestock yards. And once there, they'd unload everything and find a buyer and negotiate a price. Um, then they would return home with one of two checks for the year. The second check that they would earn would be from selling their wool. And at the time, the US Army was a major buyer of wool. They used wool for uniforms in both World War One and World War II. Um, and my grandpa was excluded from the draft of World War II because wool was an essential item for the war effort and he was raising it. Um, I can go back on the slide. So this uh, next picture is sheep being loaded on a barge on Lake Chelan. Um, and those sheep are probably headed for the Medhow. And uh, separate from my family, the Medhow has a pretty rich history of sheep. 
the sheep were grazed throughout the Methow in a similar strategy to what my family did in Idaho. Um, and they would spend the winter in the Columbia Basin and work their way grazing to the upper reaches of the Methow at the peak of the summer. Um, and here, these possibly some sheep on their way to the Methow crossing over Lake Chelan on the way. And, uh, <clears throat> and next slide. Uh, almost all of the trails in the wilderness areas surrounding the Methow are because of sheep grazing. And without sheep, those trails wouldn't exist and we wouldn't have the trails to explore and recreate in those areas today. Next slide. Uh, and a lot of the trails you can still follow. Um, they were originally marked with these yellow stock driveway signs. And some of these you can still find if you're out hiking around. A pretty major route <laughs> was going up uh, Wolf Creek and over Sandy Butte and Driveway Butte to Hard Pass. And I know there's some of those there. I've seen them before, but they're kind of cool some history if you're out in the woods and, and you see one of those, you know that the sheep came along that path at some point. The historic economic drivers of the Methow were logging, mining, and farming. The landscape full of beautiful rocks and trees that once drove the logging and mining industry drives the tourism industry today. Um, but where does farming fit in? We definitely don't have rich topsoils with warm, wet summers in the Methow that make ideal growing conditions and farming ideal. But what we do have is uh, irrigation water and rangeland. The steep mountain valley with the rivers and streams flowing everywhere made it easy and still makes it easy to direct water through gravity to irrigate crops. Historically, this was very unique for the Methow compared to much of central Washington. Um, and it was therefore very desirable for farming. The invention of mechanical pumping made it possible to transport water across all of central Washington and therefore have high production irrigated agriculture on large open spaces. Um, this is how we see much of Eastern Washington today. And so while the Met House still has irrigation water, it's not as unique and kind of valuable for agriculture in that way because irrigation can be easily distributed everywhere. Um, the large areas of shrub steppe and forests that surround the Methow create thousands of acres of rangeland that are now grazed by cattle and historically sheep. This large amount of rangeland makes it possible for ranchers to raise their cattle here and they're growing food for you and me. Next slide. Despite our valley being small and a long ways from pretty much everything, agriculture is still possible here because of the irrigation and the rangeland used for grazing. Without those two things, agriculture would probably mostly disappear from the Methow and the rural character and feel that we all love would go away with it. So next time if you're out mountain biking and you accidentally run through a cow pie or you're stuck in a traffic jam behind a tractor, remember those are some of the key things that keep the Methow special. Uh, a mix of my mom cattle ranching in Mazama and my dad growing up on a sheep ranch in Idaho landed me where I am today, sheep ranching in the Methow. Our operation is run a little differently than a traditional sheep and cow ranch like my parents grew up on. Our sheep graze on all irrigated pasture on all privately owned land. Um, like I said before, the farmland in the Methow is unique because it has I guess not super unique now, but at one point was unique because it has irrigation, but the thing that still makes it unique is the field size are very small. And therefore it's hard to farm enough acres to make a financially viable farm. 
Uh, next slide. What we do to make our farm possible today is we've created a network of farmland. We work with over 25 landowners that um, we piece together small pieces into one larger piece. And in this picture shows just some of the places that we use. All the orange highlighted areas are some of our fields. We have more, but they wouldn't fit well into the picture because they're more spread out. Um, through this network, we're able to provide regenerative management through lots of small fields that would otherwise be uncared for um, or possibly managed with toxic chemicals, killing weeds or mode, which is just burning of fossil fuels. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I think we'll maybe break for a second to ask some questions. And then next, I'm going to talk some more about uh, the regenerative management practices that we use and how those fight climate change through our sheep grazing. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions on this part of it, we'll just kind of stay in this big group, not going to breakout rooms, but anything you want to you either type it into the chat or you can just blurt it out and ask Casey. That was really fascinating, Casey. It's cool to see those networks and that history. Okay, I have a question. So Casey, I know that you really care a lot about the grain that your sheep eat. And so how do you kind of manage the quality of the grains that when you move them around? How does that work? Yeah, so our sheep don't eat uh, grain specifically, it's all um, grass and different forages, but a lot of the, the different pastures that we use do have different quality forages and um, some it's just like a lot thicker and more nutritious and some is um, thinner and maybe not quite as good a quality. And so that's something that we have to plan into our rotation because we don't want the uh, it can be hard on the animals on their digestive system if you shift from going to like a low quality feed to a high quality feed really quickly. And so we have to know each field individually and what's growing out there so that we can incorporate that into our rotation. Um, Brad uh, asks, have you been able to get access to enough land to make your operation your work or feasible? And are you looking for more land? Um, well, we're always looking for, for more land if it's in the right place or the right size of, uh, of land. That's, uh, if it's like a small piece right next to something that we're already using, then it uh, makes it so that it's feasible. But if it's a small piece a long ways away from anything else that we do, it's it can uh, be not worth our time to move the sheep all the way down there. Um, and we are, especially the last few years, uh, we've been growing quite a bit in size. And so we've been trying to, to get more, trying to get enough land um, to put all together to use. And, and what, what, what is like a minimum size that you are looking for sort of to make it work? I guess, it, like you said, it depends on, of course, the location. Yeah, but... it, it, it totally depends. So if you like if you're right next to another place where the sheep are, if you had like even maybe one or two acres would be enough. But if you're like, if we can walk the sheep there, so maybe you're within a mile or so, uh, but not right next door. If it was a little bit, it'd have to be a little mm -hmm. bit bigger, but could still be like five to 10 acre size. And if we have to put the sheep in the trailer to haul them, so more than like a couple miles away, uh, it has to be probably like 20 plus acres or so. And, and even with that, it totally depends on the quality of forage. You can have 20 acres with not very good quality and two acres with really good quality and uh, it can almost be like the same amount of feed. So I have a question, Casey, as far as you're talking about the quality of the forage. Are there rules, do you have rules about what the owners of the land can put on the land, like as far as chemicals and that kind of thing? Um, don't have any like specifically 
um, written out things, um, but we, yeah, if our sheep are going to be grazing somewhere, uh, we don't want it sprayed with, with any kind of chemicals for sure. And um, depending on if that happened at some point in the past, um, like the timeline of when that happened can determine if we will graze a piece, but um, none of the, the land that we're actively grazing the sheep on gets any kind of spray or anything like that. We have time for like, one more question before we move on here. So um, yes, sorry, I interrupted you. All right, well, um, Casey, let's, um, uh, okay, Mark asks, what practices are used to protect from predators? Um, and then we'll move on. Mm, yeah, so we have a kind of two main strategies. One, um, we have a guard dog. It's a great Pyrenees, um, it's a big, big white dog and he's fairly bonded with the sheep. And so if there's anything that is foreign, um, he'll bark at them. That's his main defense. It's just the barking. And um, I think probably if something came in to attack it, he, he'd fight back also. But the other, uh, in the summertime, our main um, strategy against predators is the fencing we use. We use portable electric fence and the electricity is a huge deterrent against predators. Um, that we have to make sure that the it's always working properly. And there is one uh, place where we grazed the sheep this uh, or this last summer and the guy said that he had watched early in the morning a bear come down kind of the hillside and was sniffing and looking at the sheep and went up and touched the electric fence and turned around and got out of there real quick. Um, and we, as long as the, the sheep are in the electric fence, we haven't really had any problems with them, um, with predators. Fantastic. So let's get into the next part. Ben, if you don't mind bringing up the presentation again, thank you. And um, Casey. All right. Um, so on our farm, we practice regenerative agriculture. Um, and in this next part, I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is and how we do it and how that's used to fight climate change. Um, so here's a definition of regenerative agriculture. And um, I'm, sure, I'm sure that many of you know that a major driving factor of climate change is from excess CO2 in the atmosphere. And if we could remove that CO2, it would help to fight climate change and avoid crazy snowstorms in Texas and massive wildfires in Okanagan County. Um, regenerative agriculture or regenerative grazing, in our case, um, can help fix these climate problems. Next slide. Uh, conventional grazing, which is shown in this picture is one of the most common methods of grazing. And this is not what we do. Uh, in conventional grazing, animals are put into a pasture for a long period of time and they're left there until everything is eaten down. Next slide. The regenerative grazing that we do has a lot of animals in a small pasture for a short period of time, like one to two days. And then the animals are removed and the field is allowed to rest and regrow. Limiting the time that the animals are in the pasture also limits the amount that they eat. Our goal when we're grazing is to have the sheep eat about 50%. And because there's so many animals in the, the small area of the pasture, um, the other 50% gets trampled down to the ground and mixed into the soil with manure and urine. Next slide. The leftover mix uh, decomposes and feeds the soil, almost forming like a compost. And so in this picture, you can see that the sheep are moving out of this pasture right now. And uh, everything down on the ground is, is trampled in and um, it's probably about a two inch thick mat of uh, grass. And another good way that I like to tell if we've 
grazed a pasture at the proper density is if I can walk through after the sheep and if in every step I step in manure, that means it was like pretty, pretty good. That's kind of our, our goal um, to get that. Um, from leaving this leftover forage that in turn feeds the soil, we can grow two to three times more forage in the future. Um, and many people think that we're just wasting forage by leaving that in there and not totally eating it down to the ground, but we think of it as building soil equity. Um, during the recovery and regrowth period, um, after we move the sheep out, the plants begin photosynthesizing. And when a plant is growing in a healthy soil, it takes in carbon through photosynthesis and produces sugar. And it only takes about 60% of the carbon that it pulls in and turns it into sugar for itself. The other 40% of the carbon, it pumps out through its roots to feed soil microorganisms. And these soil microorganisms give the plants the key nutrients that they need to grow. The microorganisms feed the plants, then die and decompose in the soil and form organic matter, which also then feeds the plants over time. It makes a complete cycle. And when working properly, it increases the total organic matter in the soil. Um, one of the key differences with regenerative and versus conventional management is that in conventional management, the nutrients from applied synthetic fertilizer are readily and easily available uh, to the plants. And when that happens, the plants don't need the microorganisms to feed them because the applied fertilizer is just right there. And therefore, the plants don't need to pump carbon into the soil to feed the microorganisms. Um, so even if there's a lush green looking field, it doesn't mean that the carbon cycle is working properly because the applied fertilizer can make the plants tall, grow green and tall and lush, um, but the carbon cycle isn't necessarily functioning properly. With regenerative agriculture, the grazing animals help to boost the carbon cycle rather than degrade it. Next slide. Um, regenerative agriculture is not a new concept and it originates from nature. The cycle of rest and growth, grazing and trampling is what created the deep rich topsoils of the Great Plains. Instead of sheep and electric fence like we use, and here's a, a picture of the electric fencing. Um, in the Great Plains, large herds of bison were moved around the landscape by predators. The bison had to stay together in tight herds to protect themselves against the predators. And so they'd get the same mob effect that we're doing with the electric fencing. And they would continually graze and move across the landscape, um, always moving on to new forage. Um, another key to regenerative grazing is the rest time. If a field is, uh, the rest period is too short, there's not enough photosynthesizing that will go on and uh, carbon won't get pumped into the soil. Um, and also the plant won't grow tall enough then to where you can leave residue or ground covering on the soil. Um, alternatively, if you rest the plant too long, um, the system doesn't work well either. After a forage plant becomes fully grown, it mostly stops photosynthesizing. And if the plant isn't actively photosynthesizing, it's not pumping carbon into the soil. Um, with our management, we try to keep the plants photosynthesizing as much as they can. And with this, we have to time our grazing and our rest periods um, just right so that the plant can become fully regrown, but not go into that phase where um, it's just kind of grown out and, and not really actively photosynthesizing anymore. Um, when the plants are actively photosynthesizing, they're acting almost like a carbon vacuum. 
And in terms of climate change, we want that vacuum on high all the time sucking in carbon. Finding the balance of the rest and grazing is critical to make successful regenerative grazing happen. On irrigated pasture, so like what we're grazing here in the Methow, the rest period in the summer between when you take the sheep out and let it regrow um, is usually like 25 to 30 days. But if you are in more of like a dry shrub step environment, that might be one to two years. Um, so it totally depends on your exact environment and your plants and your year to year rainfall and um, just lots of factors. Uh, that just shows that grazing is an art as well as a science and you have to be experienced and observant to really know when to move the animals at the right time. Um, having the animals on the landscape is also a key part to making the system regenerative. Uh, the physical action of the animals biting and tugging actually stimulates the plants to grow and signals the plant to send down new roots. Um, other benefits that the animals provide is they put microorganisms back into the soil environment through their saliva and their manure. Um, that has to do with their, their digestive system is similar to the, it's full of microorganisms similar to the soil and um, so putting those back into the soil helps the soil. And none of these benefits you get from mechanical harvesting or mowing. So that tugging action on the plant, you can't simulate that with a mower. Uh, next slide. We don't just work in the summertime in, on improving our fields either. It's a year round thing. Um, in the wintertime, we're actively managing through bale grazing um, and building compost and trying to stockpile nutrients in the field. Um, and here's a picture that if anyone's driven out towards Mazama, they've probably seen the sheep all around out standing on hay bales and eating hay bales. Um, and there's Charlie, our, our guard dog uh, that I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, next slide. So the bale grazing can have a pretty big impact on what grows the next year. Um, with the bale grazing, we set big hay bales out there and the sheep will spend a few days eating them. And through that, some of the material goes down onto the ground and they also uh, leave a lot of manure and urine on the ground. And in the spring, when things start to regrow, here's the difference. So these two pictures were taken about 10 feet apart from each other and one area was right where the we had placed a hay bale the winter before in the bale grazing site and the other one a uh, hay bale hadn't gone there and um, you can see just how much taller and thicker and more lush uh, everything is and it's probably like two to three times more forage in that area where the bale was and so that same effect of the bale is what um, with our grazing management in the summer that we're trying to get. Uh, next slide. Um, and the regenerative grazing is not just good for the environment. It can help to increase farmer profitability as well because you don't have the, have to use expensive synthetic chemicals and fertilizers. And as well as you can, it, like in that picture shows how thick and lush and tall the grass can be um, with proper management. And to get to that point of having all of your grass really thick and tall um, and a properly functioning carbon cycle takes a lot of time and dedication and hard work, but it can pay off for the farmer. Um, and the bigger thing is it can pay off for society through drawing down carbon. As a consumer, you can make the biggest difference in creating the shift to more food and fiber being grown regeneratively. Um, asking where your food comes from and knowing the practices uh, that the farm uses to grow your food and fiber can make a big difference and helping to support brands that are 
doing practices um, that are regenerative. Regenerative agriculture is starting to take hold on a big scale. Um, General Mills has said that by 2030, 1 million acres of food that is produced that goes into their products will be managed regeneratively. Um, and Patagonia has said that they're moving towards only using recycled or regeneratively grown fiber. Um, in a healthy regenerative system, organic matter can increase in the soil by 0.5 to 1% each year. And so in order for that to happen, CO2 is being sucked down into the soil and being pulled out of the atmosphere. In terms of climate change, a 0.4% increase of organic matter on the, world far, on the world's farmland would negate all current CO2 emissions. Um, at BCS Livestock, we use regenerative agriculture to sequester carbon and try and grow healthy food and fiber for our community. Um, next slide. Here are a few resources if you want to learn any more about regenerative agriculture. Um, on the top, those are both uh, movies that are pretty good and, and talk about some different aspects of regenerative agriculture. Um, I think they're both on Netflix. And then the bottom two are two books um, that are both uh, pretty, pretty good as well. Uh, next slide. And if you want to get any of our products, we have a weekly food pickup that we do. Um, things can be purchased through our online store, which is bcslivestock.com. And um, with that, we've brought in other local farm produce as well. Um, right now we have milk and eggs also available. Um, around the holidays, we had um, some locally baked sourdough products too. And um, we're working on planning for this next summer to have working with other local farms to get some produce um, and maybe some fruit and cut flowers uh, and things like that. And if you want to stay informed with what's going on there, you can sign up for our emailing list on our website. And yeah, is there any more questions with that second part? Yeah, we were wondering what the regenerative agriculture model would look like for raising cows versus sheep. Like what the difference would be there. Yeah, so uh, pretty similar with grazing. Um, kind of the keys are having that like high density. Um, and so that could be, you could have like four cows on, uh, I don't know, maybe like a hundred by hundred foot paddock for a day, or you could have 400 cows on, on two acres for a day or something like that. Um, but it's still the, the same concept of a lot of animals all really cl close together um, for a small period of time and then moving off that area onto the next area. Cool, thank you. Our group had two questions, but we'll start with this one. Um, what is the processing like? And uh, so where do you have to take the sheep? Um, and and what's what do you do after you take the sheep to the butcher? Um, yeah, so uh, we uh, process all of our meat at a USDA, which is a federally certified inspection plant. And that allows us to sell individual um, cuts or to restaurants, we can basically sell any way we want. Um, and this year we have a new butcher that we're working with and they're in Oregon, um, which is a long ways away, but um, it's a little bit bigger butcher. And so they can take more lambs at one time compared to the other one that we were using that was kind of north of Spokane, could only take a few at a time. Um, and so by 
doing that and using that new butcher, it's saving like 3,000 miles of driving over the, the course of the processing season, which is a lot of time and fuel. And um, so, yeah, those are being processed in Oregon this year. All of our lambs are. Um, and then, so we, we take the live lambs down there and um, go back like a week later and pick up frozen meat. Yeah. Um, this came from our group. Uh, Casey, could you comment on what makes grass-fed meat healthier for the consumer than grain-fed? Um, yeah, so uh, one of the main things is the omega-3 um, to omega-6 fatty acid ratios. Um, in grass-fed meat, that's um, just way better compared to grain-fed. Um, and another benefit of grass fed is it, um, helps to reduce inflammation in your body. Sometimes grain fed meat can, um, make things, uh, swell a little bit, which just makes your like joints stiff and, and stuff like that. And so, um, there's compounds in the, the grass fed meat that help to reduce those, which are just good for all around living. But uh, I was just fascinated. You 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 shared some stats on CO two sequestration, and I was like, I want to know so much more as far as soil sciences. And she shared like, oh, oh yeah, that could be a totally separate talk <laughs> slash conference on <laughs> all the information. But okay. it was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's fascinating. I think, and there's so much that we're just um learning right now about soil and soil health and plants and how the whole carbon cycle works and um like kind of kind of related to that something that's super new that just came out is that so the the plants take in the carbon and feed the soil microorganisms and the plants then benefit from two ways with those microorganisms. One, when they die and make organic matter, they can take in those nutrients, which is it, it's kind of like the conventional way of um, thinking about how plants take in nutrients. But the other thing that they've just figured out is that the plants actually absorb the living organisms. And so it's like a, they're the plants are eating the bugs in the soil through their roots. So cool. Yeah, I'll have to learn more about that. And I think Aaron's question was about how do you organize? You must have massive spreadsheets for all your grazing sites. We were fascinated by that. Yeah, uh, Google Sheets, I uh, am quite familiar with and pretty much everything's on there. I like that because it's on the computer and I can really work with things and put in different formulas and plan and um, get information, but I can also bring that up on my phone. So when I'm out in the field, uh, I can put in whatever information, how many sheep, when they're moving, how tall the grass is, whatever I need to do, as well as it's across uh, multiple people. So especially during like lambing season, when we're putting in info if like my mom or Johnny is out there, they can they can put in info and it it's all synced together. I, I'm curious. You uh, said you were seeing like a I think it was a half percent uh, gain in organic matter every year, and I, I was just wondering if in a long term a pasture that's been managed regeneratively for a long time, like does it peak out somewhere? Like what what kind of peak organic matter are you seeing in something that's been managed that way for a long time? Yeah, so those, we aren't actually seeing those on our field. We're like, that's a goal we're trying to get to there, but there's uh, people that are like way better at this than us. That, and that's what they're recording on their farms. Um, and uh, so far, at least from what I know, so far they haven't found a peak. There's some places they're up to like, I think like, 12 or 13 percent organic matter and and they've been doing this for like 15 or 20 years now and they started at like a half a percentage and so it's just kind of like 
keeps going and going and going and um, they don't know when it's going to stop. Wow. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> I, anybody... I, would like to ask, I would like to ask a quick personal question that you would expect would come from a family member. You've had the unique opportunity to be raised in a cattle environment and a sheep environment. Which do you like the best? Which has given you the most challenge and the most fun in your life? And how are you going to advise your children, grandchildren, and great grandchildren to go cattle or sheep? <laughs> um, well, that's a good question. I think I've definitely had more personal experience around sheep. Um, and I like the sheep uh, because they're dual purpose. You get the the wool and the meat, the fiber. Um, but I think the, the, the best thing is to have both because they eat uh, very different species of plants. And so they can go really well together. Um, and that's something we're kind of working on moving towards is, is trying to incorporate some, um, some cattle into our grazing system with the sheep to get that multi-species grazing um, you just get like synergies through the diversity good answer <laughs> <laughs> see a politician in the making here um, <laughs> uh, any other questions anybody might have uh, <laughs> johnny asks what is your favorite bcs hat color and you, hey what does bcs stand for i don't know i don't think i heard that covered Oh yeah, uh, BCS stands for Betsy, Casey, and Skip, which is me and my mom and dad. <laughs> and, and your favorite I, hat color, yeah. Well, I kind of like the gray hats that we have um, because they're dye free. So the gray is a mix of white and black wool. We have a few black sheep. So that, that gets intertwined together to make the, the light gray color. I, what what do you find is the best uh, forage for for sheep? But what do you what are you planting your a new pasture out in? Um, well, uh, sheep like more of like broad leaves and forbs in general. Um, we we try and incorporate a lot of diversity and into our pastures. This year we're we're reseeding um, some, trying to just like improve the quality and change the species to things that are um, more productive. And um, like one of the mixes that we're putting in is um, grass. So there's like orchard grass, tall fescue grass. Um, we'll have uh, red clover, some alfalfa and uh, a forage variety of plantain and chicory. Mm. Um, and those both the, well, especially the plantain has like really big, huge kind of broad leaves um, that the sheep really like. And they, yeah, they like all the, the, the kind of forbs or a lot of like weeds of things. They, uh, depending on the time of year, they really like Barnaby thistle. Um, they'll nibble all the little leaves off of it or any kind of those more like shrubby, weedy type plants. The, those are what they go for first when you turn them into a pasture. Okay, hi. I was just wondering, um, does all this pasture rotation enable you or allow you to uh, to have a more organic approach to, to raising your sheep? Does it help reduce the parasite load when you move them so frequently? Yeah, definitely. Um, the uh, parasites are can definitely be an issue, especially with sheep. Um, and there's a, a certain kind of worm that the, we have problems with sometimes in our, in, that's a problem with sheep specifically. Um, and the, the, the larva of the worm can only grow up four inches on the plant. And as well as its life cycle is about uh, 25 to 30 days. And so with our grazing strategy, um, by only taking 50%, um, that 50% um, 
will be above four inches. So if we're, if we're grazing properly, they're not, the sheep aren't eating down to the height of where that um, parasite can live. And then um, we've also been lengthening our rest period just a little bit more, um, kind of in that like 30 to 40 day range, just so that hopefully we will break that cycle um, of the, the parasite living there. And th another thing that um, kind of hoping to, to try with that is um, with incorporating some cattle, they uh, have a different, different parasites affect them and the parasites that affect the sheep don't affect the cattle. And so you can, um, by doing the multi-species grazing, you can like even lengthen that time period of when the sheep are actually grazing a field longer, but still um, keep your plants growing well, keep that carbon pump going and um, utilizing that forage, but with the multi-species. Casey, will you tell us about your uh, wool production process? Like who comes to cut the wool and where do you send it for, for uh, weaving or whatever? Yeah, so um, we shear in the springtime before lambing. So we wanna make sure that it's starting to warm up before we get uh, clip off their thick wool coats. And um, there's, uh, we have shears that come in and that's kind of all they do. They travel around at least seasonally in the springtime and go from um, farm to farm and shear sheep. And um, like this last year, it was two full days of work for two guys and um, they, they clip the fleeces off and we put them then into these big bales uh, that weigh like three to 400 pounds each. We have this big mechanical press that pushes all the wool together. And um, for our different products, we, we send them a couple different places. The blankets are made in Canada um, and that mill is totally turnkey. So we send in the raw wool to them and they send us back the finished blankets. Um, and for the hats is a little bit different. We have to use two different manufacturers. Um, first, the raw wool goes to Wyoming and it's um, done all of the steps through the process into making yarn. So it's like washing and carding and spinning. Um, and then from the, and they do the dyeing also. And then uh, from there, the yarn goes to Colorado to another small manufacturer and um, they do the knitting there and then send us back the finished hats. Wow. 